Nanga Parbet is a mystery. What is it? We don't know. Plain and simple is science just hasn't quite figured it out. Uh, the eighth highest mountain in the world. Not this mountain, however. Uh, we didn't have the rights to that picture, but Nanga Parbet is a mountain. It's also Steve Finn's latest game. Although it certainly is an abstract game, it is assuredly dripping with theme. Now, Nanga Parbet could have been one of those easily themeless abstract games, a game where a theme isn't required, it's not necessary, but it benefits from having the theme that's been chosen. Players are led by a guide up the mountains and set up base camps and trap animals for food and clothing. Well, thematically and in real life, it makes sense, but I have to separate myself from the fact that in this game, when I'm turning in points, what I'm actually doing is eating a cute little red panda. But the gist of it is, depending on where the guide is on any particular peak during the game, on your turn, you take one of the animals at a specific peak and place one of your little meeples there. You've got a little climber. And whatever number corresponds with the animal spot that you've taken, you move the guide to that spot. And the next player then has to choose an option from that location. As is the case with any abstract game, for me, there is an expectation and then there's a reality when it comes to the fun factor. And where my expectations were with Nanga Parbet was tempered to be sure, where it ended up was something that was much more surprising and much more exciting. Each of these animals has a specific unique ability that you can use at any point during your turn and you can use any amount of animals one time. And this is where the graphic design and the, the physical design choices of the game really shine because when you use one of the animal's special abilities you slide it from the top section of the board down to the bottom. You can trade animals for points whether you've used their ability or not but holding off and waiting may benefit you because you can then use the power associated with each specific animal. But then waiting too long could possibly mean that you don't net the same amount of points. The game has this shared area where if you score points for collected animals, you place one of your little squares there. And suddenly this means that the other player cannot earn eight points for that type of trade-in. And so you have to weigh the benefits of keeping animals long enough to use their ability so that you can advance yourself in the game and potentially hurt the other player, or do you trade them off as quick as you can so that you can earn points before your opponent. And so while the moral quandaries of eating cute animals uh, with no real purpose other than to score points in the game, that guilt, that w the moral quandaries that went along with that dropped exponentially uh, as the game went on while the fun and the strategy continued to climb all the way up. There isn't a single thing about this game that I dislike. Oh no, that's not true. I wish that there was an animal reference sheet on the back of the, of the rule book instead it's on the last page. Um, that's about it though. I mean, the fact that they do this and you don't have reference cards, after, you don't even have reference cards to deal with, which generally I do like reference cards a lot, but this game is done away with the need for text. It's done away with the need for references or decks of cards. It's taken an engaging, fun idea, condensed it down into a time frame of about 30 minutes while remaining compelling and competitive. It's not a straight take that attack your opponent type of game. It's uh, cerebral and it's it's very pretty to look at and it, it's fun to interact with and you don't have to worry about cards or text um, or rules clarifications because everything's very clear and everything looks really nice. It's a game that risked being dull. Had this only been a game where you um, take an animal and place a meeple and then the next person takes their turn, it would have been straightforward and maybe fun for a player too. However, with every single one of these animals having some sort of benefit to obtaining them, other than the benefit of getting points by collecting either sets or different types of animals, because there's that difference, because there are more decision points to be made, when to use those animals, when to cash things in, the fact that you're not just, you can't cash in animals anytime you'd like, you can't pitch tents anytime you'd like because you have to have a specific amount. And the player that is able to score those points first ends up getting the advantage in that specific category. And so there's tension, there's decisions to be made. That brings us to the most important part of this review, the verdict. And what do I think of this game? Oh, I think it's real good. 
what could have ended up being a bobbing bit of cardboard and paper and wood in a sea of mediocre abstract games ends up being one of my favorite games that I've played this year. Uh, definitely my favorite Steve Finn game. Uh, admittedly, I've only played four of them. Now, Biblios was the first game that the Dice Tower conned an entire generation into buying of Dr. Finn's games. And that wasn't a bad thing because it's a very fun game. However, Herbaceous came along and I very much enjoyed that one quite a bit and still do. The Little Flower Shop was also a lot of fun. But then Nanga Parbat comes along. And in my opinion, this is Dr. Finn's best game. And unfortunately, it also is going to join the ever-growing list of prototypes that I am loath to give up. But other people need to review this. This is a game that deserves the spotlight. It deserves as much attention as it can get because I don't know if it's it's especially the time that we're at right now, like the fact that it is such a good abstract two-player game. This is just, this is in the right spot for me right now. And if it looks interesting to you, maybe it's something that you should check out as well. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed this or you would like to see something more, please like, subscribe, leave a comment. Let me know what you'd like to see in the future. Um, if there's any suggestions, I'm completely open to it. We are still trying to get to that thousand subscriber mark and we are getting closer every single day. So thank you so much for those, to those of you that have subscribed so far. So yeah, I mean, I didn't eat any actual red pandas in this game and that's probably not even what they were used for. Um, the game specifies that they were used for, that, that you use them for either clothing or food. I just assume maybe both, right? Like a red panda looks nice and soft and I imagine it tastes pretty good. I'd give it a shot.